So I, as I was saying, uh, welcome to the WING seminar. This is our second session and we have Miranda Lubers uh, as a presenter. And um, we are super happy today because today is the first, uh, we call it uh, pathways of networks. <laughs> so uh, it's a really different kind of talk, but also maybe it's going to be super useful for a lot of the people who are in here. And the idea is to promote the discussion between us and a lot of comments. So if you feel comfortable and at some point you need to say something, you can just say it and go ahead, please. Because Miranda already told us please promote that kind of collaboration and conversation. Um, so Miranda Lubes is an associate professor at the Department of Social and Cultural Anthropology of the Autonomous University of Barcelona in Spain. She directs the research group of fundamentally oriented and anthropology, Grafo, <laughs> or consoli uh, and consolidate a group recognized by the Catalan government, which is the same organization. Uh, her research addressed social cohesion and social inclusion, and in particular, she analyzed uh, in particular she analyzed the role that formal and informal social relationships and settings have in the production, mitigation, or exacerbation of exclusion and segregation. So now we are going to go ahead, and Miranda, I give you the space for you. <laughs> Well, thank you so much and thank you uh, Francisca and Alice and Echo for inviting me. Uh, it's really nice to do this. Uh, I'm also a little bit nervous because it's a very different seminar <laughs> than <laughs> we tend to give, right? Um, so let me share the screen. Um, okay, yes. can you see that? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, so um, yes, it's a Pathways in Network Science uh, seminar today. And so what I will be doing is uh, dedicate the first part of the talk to my career so far. I actually feel like halfway my career, although that is probably not true. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, so this is also uh, to show, I, I think that's the nice thing about these kind of seminars that you can see how you know people have very different uh, careers, some moves are strategical and others are coincidental, right? And, uh, but anyway, you can still have uh, similar sort of um, careers after that. Um, and uh, then after that, I will talk about some general thoughts that I had about ac academic careers on the basis of my, uh, my own experiences. And also, I hope that that sort of uh, stirs up a discussion <laughs> about some of these things like acceptance and rejections in academia. Uh, how to find your path, uh, time management, and uh, gender biases. Okay, so to give you an overview of my uh, pathway, <laughs> um, I started in uh, Groningen, um, where I studied uh, quantitative sociology. So I come from a family, my, uh, both my parents were working at 16 years, and they didn't have that kind of opportunity to go to the university. Um, and so I wanted to go actually to art academy and my parents, my father, you know, who felt that I had this opportunity and I had to, to take it, he said, well, why don't you go and study like something like economy or law or something serious. And so uh, sociology was a bit in the middle of that <laughs> for me, uh, although that may not make any sense for you. But anyway, <laughs> it was a bit between the, the economy and law, which was for me a bit too uh yeah um serious maybe in some way and uh my more artistic uh drive so to speak um so i went to groningen and i studied uh, sociology at a department that was very quantitatively oriented my thesis advisor was tom snyders my ms uh, my master thesis advisor who you might know as he is doing a lot of research on statistical models in social networks so I learned from him about multi-level networks, uh, multi-level analysis and social network analysis. And he's been actually like a very strong support throughout my career. Um, and so after that, uh, I went on to study, um, to do my PhD studies also in Groningen at the Institute for Education. Um, there they were doing a national longitudinal cohort study in secondary education with 20,000 students and 800 school classes. 
And so uh, they were working on that. They were collecting the data for that. And they allowed me to add a sociometric module in years one and two to study the structure of these peer networks in secondary education. And so they also allowed me to get Tom back into <laughs> the supervisor uh, team. Uh, so he helped me with things like uh, ergums and uh, stochastic actor oriented uh, models, which were a bit in their inf infancy by then. Um, so that's what I have been doing uh, during that time. I've been studying these networks of, of students, uh, secondary school students in school classes, um, how they are structured, how they change over time as well, how gender <laughs> has to do with these changes. And um, on the basis of that, I wrote uh, eight first author journal articles um, on the basis of that research, which were published also a bit later than that, because you know that sometimes uh, you know, the publishing process is very slow. And for one article, I had to go through eight reviews. So that's just to tell you a little bit that it's not always easy. <laughs> but this definitely helped me um, in this, uh, the following stages of my career to have published well in the beginning. Okay, so that was the formative stage, so to speak, of my career. I had my PhD thesis and then uh, my postdoc, first postdoc. And um, during that second, during our postdoc, I also met my husband at a wedding, actually. So um, my Dutch friend was married to, uh, of, or was going to marry to a Spanish, uh, to a Spanish girlfriend. And so I went to Spain for the wedding. And there at the wedding, I met my husband and he was Spanish. And so we traveled up and down for a while. Uh, and at some point, of course, someone had to move. So we both tried to find work in the other country. And I was the first one. Uh, so I got a Rubicon Fellowship for a year from the Dutch government uh, to do postdoctoral research again. Uh, but this time uh, I went to the group, to the only group that I knew that was working on uh, networks at the time. Of course, now I know that there are many more groups in Spain that work on networks. But by then I knew Jose Luis Molina and his group. And so I went to uh, that group and I started to work with him and with Christopher McCarthy on the project that they had about personal networks of immigrants. Um, and so this was a big change, uh, both uh, as a migration move, right? To go from the Netherlands to Spain, uh, also to go from a Dutch university system and culture to a Spanish university system and culture, which is very different actually, but also substantively. So I went from school networks to uh, personal networks of immigrants, and uh, methodologically that entails going from social centric analysis, you know, with school classes and the networks of everyone within that to egocentric analysis to look at one person and the network that that person has uh, around him or her. And also I went from a highly quantitative uh, social science department to a uh, sociology department actually, or sociology and education. Uh, to a highly qualitative uh, anthropology department, because that's where Jose Luis Molina was working. And that was also a really big change, probably the biggest one uh, of all, right? And it took me really quite some time to learn from qualitative research as well, and because I wasn't trained in that, so that was more learning while doing. Uh, of course, I also had to teach uh, anthropology students and uh, work with anthropology anthropologists um, and also evaluate anthropology students. So uh, this required that I was going ahead also and learned uh, more qualitative research. And after that first grant, I got to Spanish postdoctoral grants. So as you can see, I've been, you know, accumulating postdocs for, for well, 11 or 12 years, I think. Um, so one uh, was a Catalan grant and then the Spanish uh, Ramón y Cajal grant. And I continued working on migration and networks in different projects. Okay, so the main project there is actually also something that we developed in multiple projects uh, where we interviewed uh, uh, migrants about their personal networks. That was the original study of Chris McCarthy and José Luis Molina. And that's where we uh, collected the first interviews, the first uh, data. And then in a follow-up project by José Luis Molina, we did uh, follow-up interviews with the same people. And in my third uh, postdoc there, I also did interviews with 50 people again uh, of the same people who had participated before. So we had these longitudinal sort of uh, um, trajectories of migrants uh, in 
a host country. We could see how it changed over time. And as you can see, these are quite complex data. So for each person, we asked about 45 network contexts and um, at every time point. And we asked them also how these were, they were related among them. So they are really like small networks. <laughs> Uh, and of course, you can then study how they changed over time, whether there were more people uh, or different people in other interviews, what the turnover is, and whether you can see some sort of integration, social integration throughout the, the networks. And it was interesting, I think. It's, uh, it's one of my favorite projects <laughs> that I've been doing because, of course, we can see that even though... Uh, we think always of integration as a bit of a linear project. This is not at all uh, the case. We can see that it fluctuates very much over time. So sometimes people become much more or much less embedded. Uh, and this is actually more like a byproduct of, of life events. So if people marry or get children or their children go to school, for example, then that really changes their network and it has not much to do with their agency. Okay, so this was the postdoctoral stage, so to speak. Um, first, the Rubicon postdoctoral fellowship, then one of the Catalan uh, um, government, and then the last one is the Ramonica Gal Tenure Track postdoctoral fellowship. It was a five-year postdoctoral fellowship, and uh, it was a tenure track position in the sense that if you had a positive evaluation at the end, then you would be hired at the university. Um, also, well, for full <laughs> disclosure, my son was born in the middle of that. Um, so I had nine months in which I had complete nausea. And then four months, of course, of uh, um, a motherhood uh, maternity leave. Uh, so, um, yeah, that was sort of a breakup in, uh, during that time. I think that everyone has that kind of thing within their careers and it's normal. And so definitely if you have these kind of desires then don't wait for the right moment, which never comes. So, um, okay, so after that, uh, as I said, I had a tennis track position. So then slowly I went to uh, the associate professor position and that multiplied the tasks. So while formally I could work mostly on research and then had some teaching and so on as well, uh, now teaching was like the main task and then there was a lot of uh, university management and then research was a little bit like, uh, yeah, also important, but something that is never the priority. Um, so I had 22 credits, European credits per year, which is about 625 hours of teaching a year in the bachelor and master program. Uh, the, the hours are not just the teaching hours, but also the, uh, you know, the preparation and the evaluation task and so on. And then uh, I had mentored students, PhD students and master's students. Apart from that, I, you know, entered in management tasks. This was kind of hard because I wasn't trained for that. And I don't know if it's different now, <laughs> if you are trained for such kind of things uh, like leadership or, you know, the design of, of leaflets and uh, stuff like that. Um, or time management even, uh, but I wasn't. And so it was really a sort of a um, yeah, learning process as well. I directed in the beginning the, um, the master and PhD stud studies in anthropology and later on only the PhD studies, which are like 65 students uh, at the same time in the program. Um, and I was the director of the research group, as Francisca also said, um, which was a group of 12 senior researchers and then a lot of PhD students as well. And also I had multiple research projects that I directed. And so this was sort of learning how to manage time well. And then um, research, as I said, I had to actively make time for that um, so that I had to work a lot. <laughs> and uh, also, um, um, so that was a sort of a negative thing that it's, you really need to be aware of making time for it because otherwise there's always another priority. Of course, if you have to teach classes, you need to have the, the classes ready when you're starting to teach. So, I mean, this is a priority over writing an article, for example, and management is, is just like that, right? It's not the priority. Uh, I mean, it is a priority over research. On the other hand, the good thing about being an associate professor is that you got more agency in choosing your research topics as well. So, uh, and also in applying for grants as a, a principal investigator. So that gives you a little bit more uh, uh, 
ways to really get your interest back into the research as well. Although, I mean, as I said, I really love the migration research, so that was not a problem at all. But uh, definitely that is something that comes with having a tenure position, right? And I also wrote this book about personal networks with Chris McCarthy and Rafael Baca and uh, uh, Jose Molina, which was also really uh, something I love to do, uh, to write this together. And uh, it was kind of hard to co-write a book and uh, to come up with a book that then at the end didn't have four voices, but really like reads like one voice. So we went over the whole text, every one of us, and uh, rewrote and uh, re-edited and so on so to, to make that happen. So substantively then, um, what I changed uh, also, what, what the research was that I was going to do after that was first of all inspired by the financial crisis. So from 2008 to 2014, there was a really heavy financial crisis in Spain. and. Um, um, yeah, this, this made me uh, interested in understanding this kind of exclusion. So while I formerly had focused on migration and the exclusion that can come with that, I now focused on income poverty. So one project that we had was about how do personal networks help or hinder people experiencing income poverty. So in the social networks literature, uh, personal networks are very often seen as a social support, as a, a resource of social support. And while this may be true at the micro level, if we take one step back and look at the macro level, then uh, that may not be the case, right? So people who are already having a good income have more support than people who are, you know, having uh, lower incomes. And so we wanted to investigate that, whether, you know, people who were having, who were bearing the effects of the financial crisis um, got help from their personal networks or were actually it was like an added um, um, hinder, hinder, hindering factor. So indeed what we found was that personal networks in this case uh, erode. So I mean because of these um, um, norms like norms of reciprocity, of kin obligation, of uh, autonomy, you're supposed to be autonomous if you have your own household, for example. Um, uh, people who are living in, in poverty didn't get the support that they needed. Um, so, so social support worked very well for, you know, uh, temporary support, but not for sustained support. And in that case, uh, it affects the personal network. So in the end, the uh, family networks and so eroded and people had an additional factor of vulnerability on top of their income poverty. I was also interested in how uh, wider personal networks shape our perceptions of society. This also came with a personal sort of um, uh, observation that I, you know, it was a really heavy financial crisis. And I, if I looked around, uh, I could see that, um, you know, the people in my neighborhood, at my work, uh, at the school of my, my child, for example, they weren't really too badly affected. Um, so some people did lose their job, but I mean, in general, it wasn't that bad. But if we interviewed people in poverty, then it was all kind of, you know, uh, eviction and uh, having to go to food banks and not only them, but also their, their context. So this also made me think about how our wider personal networks, our acquaintanceship networks, are structured and, uh, and to what extent they are actually having these sort of um, cleavages by a social class, right? So if, if the, or wider acquaintance networks have that, then that may affect our perception. So if you have a wider environment of like the 500 people that you know, that you, you know, uh, come across during your daily life, if they are doing kind of okay, then you might think that the crisis is not that heavy, for example, or is, is bad, but it's not, terrible, uh, while if you're in another part of this network, then you may actually see this as, as a very, very uh, severe crisis, right? So this is what also drove my later research and uh, started my current research into social cohesion. Also wider acquaintanceship networks, which haven't received a lot of attention so far. So most of personal network research is focused on the strongest uh, ties and not so much on these, you know, vaguer acquaintances, although we all know that they can also influence our, our lives, and also on how to measure them. So this is also something that I'm also interested in, uh, in measurement, in um, methodological development. 
And then on the basis of the Catalan independence uh, issue and also with Brexit, uh, I also started to think about this a, a bit more and about what can we do uh, with political polarization in personal networks. Um, and because this is something that we also saw around us uh, that, um, you know, in, within our networks, friendship networks, family networks, these kind of issues sort of broke up sometimes the networks. And, um, and have this effect. So how do people deal with political polarization in personal networks is the other issue I started working on, on this and in this moment as well. So this is then the, the more like current uh, yeah, associate professor part of the career, right? That in the beginning I was an interim associate professor because of the same issue of the financial crisis. There was no money for uh, actually um, getting people fixed at that moment. So I had to wait a little bit and Right now, it's a bit of the same situation. So in 2017, I had my accreditation for a full professor. And usually the idea is that you're then quite rapidly being uh, uh, nominated as professor, full professor. And I'm now on a waiting list. And probably this year, <laughs> it will become different. Um, but OK. So uh, and right now, there's these three things that I so uh, during the um, COVID um, pandemia, pandemic. Actually, 2020 was my most successful year, which is a little bit bad to say, <laughs> given the context. But anyway, uh, I got a ICREA Academia Fellowship, which is a Catalan fellowship and which gives you for five years a buyout for teaching and also gives you more resources. Uh, it's a fellowship that's meant to support researchers in an expensive phase and it's really fantastic i think for uh it's exactly for that right so i'm, I'm really happy that i was uh, selected for that also i uh, was awarded well we were awarded i was awarded the erc advanced grant uh, in 2021 um, and started this project it's a really large uh, research project called a network science approach to social cohesion in european societies which is based on this idea that i said before of uh, uh, looking at acquaintanceship networks and trying to measure via these acquaintanceship networks how cohesive society is um, um, across boundaries of uh, ethnicity, uh, social class, religion and political orientation. And um, so this is something that I'm working on right now with the team. And um, we also got this grant, the Volkswagen Foundation project grant, which also a big grant, but in consortium this time. Inclusivity norms to counter polarization in European societies. And so this is a project uh, with five universities. That's what I'm working on right now. And I also decided then to give up the <laughs> direction of the research group, the Grafo research group, uh, and focus more on the, the, the group of people that I had to uh, um, well lead, right? And to focus more on these grants that I have to do, which is a big responsibility. So it's also, it's of course a great honor. It's also a big responsibility. It also pushes me to think more uh, further, uh, bigger, so to speak, uh, of course, because with smaller grants, there are smaller responsibilities and also smaller options. And now you have to think more ambitiously, right? So what can you do? Uh, that really pushes this, this research area further. And so therefore I wanted to be able to concentrate on that. And uh, I started the Coalesce Lab, which is then a lab within the Grafo, which is now being led by Jose Luis Molina. Uh, and yeah, within this group, um, I um, am hiring postdocs and PhD students, and which is an interdisciplinary group. Some people have computational social science or computational science background, others, uh, anthropology, uh, sorry, uh, uh, sociology and also uh, political sciences. And it's really, I think it's really nice to work um, in such an interdisciplinary environment. Okay, so this is the first part. Uh, then uh, I think it would be nice to think a little bit about uh, the academic careers in, in general. And also please feel free, as uh, Francisco already said, to intervene and to also give your thoughts about it or ask questions or whatever. Um, so this is not based on any science, it's just based on my own uh, um, uh, career and what I've felt or what I thought uh, in, on the basis of that. And I think that everyone, everyone who's giving such a seminar may come up with different ideas and this may be helpful maybe, hopefully. 
One thing is about acceptance and rejection. Of course, this is a really big theme uh, for early career scholars and uh, really a difficult thing to learn, right? That we have so many rejections uh, as academics. And so even though we always present a success story, of course, we have all had rejections. And for every grant that I've had, I've had at least one uh, that I wasn't accepted for and uh, articles, etc. cetera, equally. Uh, so that's invisible on CVs, but that is part of just uh, life, academic life in general. My favorite example is uh, the paper of Mark Granovater, uh, The Strength of Weak Ties, which is really one of the most uh, important papers in uh, my research area and has had 65,000 citations and was rejected on the first, uh, in the first journal where it was sent to and was only accepted in the second one, which was still a very good journal, by the way. But, um, I think it was, in my case, it was helpful to have uh, published in journals of good standing early on in my career. So then, I mean, it's, it's just something that's starting to roll and then later on it's easier to, you know, um, um, get uh, accepted for things uh, when you have that. Also, I would definitely, um, yeah, try to encourage you to do that because for my, uh, in my experience, writing for a lesser, journals, so to speak, lesser in terms of, you know, um, uh, citation impact and whatever. Um, it's actually sort of the same amount of work uh, as in better journals. Of course, there are a couple of journals that are really hard to publish in, but I mean, uh, generally uh, do try to publish in good journals if you can. Even though with SF Dora, this shouldn't be so important anymore. I do think it's still very important. So, yeah. Also write good application letters and convincing grant applications, of course, is easy to say, but <laughs> uh, something that I've seen now that I've been hiring people is uh, that some people are focusing their application letters on what they have done so far. Um, and so they are sort of replicating their curriculum. And what we actually want to see in the letter is, is why you are the perfect person for that job, right? And so to make some connection with the job or with the project, uh, is really important in letters and so that was something that was really recurrent and which is I think is a pity because it just you know it's it doesn't say anything about you um, what kind of letter you have written at that moment but it is important for being hired so the best predictor for success in grants and publishing is maybe <laughs> this is also not based on research but it's my own idea the number of submissions so the more you submit then in the end that you will be have you know you have will have things that are successful as well so do take that into account that it's normal to get rejected and just you know don't uh, be disencouraged for that also be aware it is often not personal right so for I, I see this now from the other side because i was hiring people that uh, i've had really awesome people uh, applying that i have not hired uh, which I would have, uh, whom I would have loved to have in my group, but you can only pick one person and uh, you have to choose the person who has the best match with the project. So that's, you know, that doesn't mean anything about the people that were rejected them in so, such uh, a way. This is important to understand, right? Because it's, we often take it as a personal rejection, which is not necessarily the case. Also, in my personal experience, I've also, of course, uh, applied for many things and 20 years later, I met one of the people who I had apparently <laughs> uh, applied with, right? Uh, I didn't remember at that moment, but anyway, he said to me, uh, we were wrong at that moment, right? We should have hired you and we didn't. And so it's also, it was kind of funny because, you know, I didn't even remember, but um, it is also, it was also nice because it is some, um, sort of a, it shows that it is a momentary decision based on uh, incomplete information and that, you know, uh, people may be wrong about that as well, right? So that's, that's, I think it's important to be aware of that. Nonetheless, it's also good to learn what your strengths and weaknesses are and listen to constructive uh, critique. If, of course, if people are assholes then you don't have to listen to them, but uh, if they, <laughs> Um, if it is constructive feedback, it might be important to actually learn and see what, what you can do about it. Having said that, we all have weaknesses that are just there. I mean, we can't do everything perfectly. And so, but it is good to also sort of uh, use your strengths uh, and also find ways to compensate for weaknesses. Okay. Um, then on finding, oh, I have the, 
just oh, finding your pathway, yes. <laughs> um, in my case, I found this inspiration societal challenges, uh, which may work for you or may not work for you. Um, I think it is what keeps me interested, uh, but it's also very easy in that case to explain why a project is necessary, for example, why it is relevant, right? So to tie that uh, closely to societal challenges is a way to, in my case, was a way to find my pathway. Um, also changing research topics and approaches as cost, right? To go from, from, for example, peer networks and schools to migration has cost because you have to familiarize yourself again with a whole new literature that you didn't know about. It costs time also to create new networks, to find uh, the right conferences to present to, uh, to create a bit of a reputation in your area that you're reckoned with, right? Um, but it also give you, uh, gives you a unique profile and strengths. And so sometimes it is also something that makes you, you, right? And, and so uh, instead of just completely doing away with the former uh, research, try to have it influence your current research as well it can be a good idea, right? So in my case, for example, I went from very quantitative uh, social sciences to qualitative social sciences a bit more. Uh, I'm still with quantitative sciences, but uh, I learned also how to do qualitative research. And I do believe that in my case, uh, having that quantitative background made me a better qualitative researcher. I don't want to say that everyone would uh, feel that uh, that way or for everyone it would work that way. But for me, it worked that way that I feel that I'm a better qualitative researcher because of my quantitative uh, skills and also the other way around. I'm a better quantitative researcher for myself or better than I was because of I, uh, having learned that thing about qualitative research. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's something that has cost, but also gives you opportunities and gives you a unique profile. Um, so does mobility. So mobility definitely has also costs, right? You also have to get to know a new group of people, a new country with its research networks and so on. Uh, of course, also it, it builds toward your unique profile, so it is interesting, especially when you get older, however, of course, you do have this problem of having your parents far away who are now needing a bit more of help, and this is some, that's also a cost, right, of having migrated. Um, so, yeah, it's something to take into account. Um, if you do change, make these changes, if you change topics quite a bit, uh, then it is also interesting to find sort of the leitmotiv in what you're doing, um, which is probably not so much necessary for yourself as more to present yourself to others. So I've seen people being rejected because they, you know, the research went all over the place, so to speak, and it wasn't clear what sort of the constructive coherent line in the research uh, trajectory was. And actually, it's usually there, but I mean, if you know how to present it, if you can sort of explain what it, what everything has to do with one another, uh, at least at the point right where it all comes together in what you're doing right now, then this might be helpful for you, especially in presenting towards, you know, uh, for grants and for stuff like that. In my case, I also find it interesting to build projects on former projects to sort of, you know, form a string of accumulated knowledge. This is, of course, especially true for countries where um, there is no, not so much research funding, so you have smaller projects. Um, and then, of course, it is difficult to build something bigger, but you can do that by just, you know, doing sort of a string of research projects. And this is, for example, how my current ERC advanced grant project came about. So it first started with a survey module a national survey module in Spain, where which gave very little room for actually measuring things, uh, but it did give an idea that this method would actually work well. Uh, then I had a smaller project, a national project, um, which sort of gave the proof of concept that it worked really. Uh, and now I have this ERC advanced grant project, which is really expanding on that, making it uh, upscaling it to a, a European level, but also. Uh, you know, expanding on it in different ways, um, substantively. I think it is nice to have a sort of a long-term plan, uh, even if it changes all the time, <laughs> but to keep yourself sort of, you know, what is it that you want to do with your life, uh, with your future research? Uh, what are your goals or your dreams or things you'd like to accomplish? Uh, I have sort of a small list 
somewhere secret small list of things that I would like to do. And <laughs> uh, that may be substantively, it may be things like I would like to publish in that journal or I would like to, I don't know, uh, write a book on this and that topic or something like that. And it may be something that even though it may change and of course uh, in seven years, you won't be the person that you are now, well, you're still the person that you are now, but maybe your, um, your you know, preferences have changed. Uh, but it's still, it, it does give you a little bit of a drive to uh, what it is that you want to do next. So that may help maybe. And also keep ties to your main communities. I've done that wrong. <laughs> so I've really focused on social network analysis and went to every Sunbelt conference. Well, maybe not every, but still quite a lot. Uh, and for example, didn't go as much to sociology conferences, um, which I now am trying to sort of correct for, because I do believe it is actually interesting and important to also keep that kind of tie. And so, yeah, you, if, if you're still at the beginning of your career, you can think about that more strategically and think, okay, I do want to be, have that kind of community as well, right? Okay, I'm almost uh, there. With regard to time management, uh, it is, of course, especially if you're a bit further in your career and you need to juggle this many uh, uh, tasks, it's really important to learn how to manage time. Maybe you can do a course or something about that as well. And also strategies that reduce stress, because that's, of course, what we do have. It's something that I also uh, juggle with a lot, with how to you know, keep stress levels at a sort of manageable uh, level. For me, it works uh, very much to keep a good record of my tasks. Um, I use Trello for that. There are, of course, um, very many <laughs> uh, programs that you can use, but this is sort of my setup in which I have various lists, things that, are, that I've committed to, but that are not immediately, that I don't need to do anything for right now. Things that I should do, but not in the coming 14 days then things that I have to do within 14 days, something that I am doing right now, right? <laughs> uh, today and tomorrow. Some things that are waiting for input that are done, but not done to be moved to the done list yet. A recurring task and then the done list. And the most, of course, satisfying things is moving things to that done list. <laughs> uh, so this is actually the only reason why I keep it there. Um, but uh, yeah, this really helps me. And, and also, of course, it's, you can move things around, you can label it, you can tie it to uh, um, uh, files, for example, you can give it dates. And, and so it pops up uh, yellow when it's very close to the date, to the due date. Um, and this is really, for, for me, very helpful. Uh, also to block time for writing or analysis. Um, as I said, sometimes it is really difficult to make time for that because there are always other priorities than writing, a, writing an article. So it may work to just have, I don't know, one hour a day, two hours a day, or two hours a week, whatever you can have, but uh, in which you don't check your email um, before that time, you don't check social media, just focus on writing or analysis without thinking about the rest. Um, also, uh, I don't know if I said that. Yeah, okay, For, to focus on the things I need to do today and without worrying too much about everything else, right? that's why these sort of uh, programs also help you with uh, to, you know, to just put it on a list and it's somewhere there, you, can, you won't forget about it, but you don't have to think about it today. This really keeps my stress levels to acceptable levels because you're just thinking, okay, today, what's it that I have to do? That's what I'm going to think about. And in my case also, if you're a per perfectionist, uh, then it may be good to push some things a little bit more toward the deadline, which doesn't seem to make sense. But uh, if you give me uh, like three months to prepare something, I will take three months. And if you give me one week to prepare something, I will take one week. Uh, and it is not necessarily much worse than what I would have done in three months. So if you don't have the time to work on everything for months and months in a row, it does help you to push, push some things a little bit further ahead and keep work as pleasant as possible, of course. Right, and the last thing, which is the gender issues, uh, gender bias thing, this is actually based on research uh, because of course we don't really need to say that it is different to be a woman in science than it is to be a man in science. There is a lot of evidence that shows that indeed uh, student evaluation, recommendation letters, qualifications, uh, co-authoring uh, options and also evaluations of articles, etc. Citations are all kind of biased by, by gender 
and well this is what we have right this is <laughs> we can't really uh uh avoid um also at some point you know uh you can have some you can feel some hostility from people if you are becoming more successful for example uh because of being uh becoming sort of a uh, competition right so and with this this is just a gender bias of course we have other forms of bias like racism uh is very yeah we could probably have the same sort of list for uh, race as as we could for gender um or worse even uh classism as well right being a first gen person doesn't really is, isn't the same thing as having parents for example who have um uh, university degrees and other sorts of bias so yeah what can we do uh <laughs> not uh well be aware of of the narrative i i don't know where yes i said that yeah sorry be aware of the narrative this is important some things are going uh, very implicit subtle or even oh. subconscious and it is good to to just be aware of that right and be on top of it as well so if you seek some narratives that are slightly going in the wrong direction then actually uh, sort of correct that and do that on a systematic basis maybe if you're an early career scholar it's difficult to do that because you might not you might run into some sort of problems uh, if you are further in your career it is more easy to do that right and to say okay this is not a good thing we should be aware of that um, but this is where many of the things uh, many of these biases are in the narratives, right, and the words that are being used. Uh, so the, this is really important, I think. Um, also promote yourself, have your website, promote others as well, um, and be aware of your own bias, right, in citations and syllabi, and also in recommendation letters, there are some really good tools for that that can help you uh, see your own bias, right, like Jane Sumner's gender balance assessment tool, or Tom Ford's gender bias calculator. And of course, build supportive networks, uh, Three of them in network science are women in network science, uh, the NOTS, uh, the Network of Diverse Scholars, and the Society of Young Network Scholars. And these are, of course, very great opportunities uh, to actually come together and work on it together and also, you know, discuss these kind of issues together. Okay, thank you. <laughs> That was amazing. Thank you so much, Miranda. Um, I'm going to start the recording right now.